You know that boy that I stopped speaking to when I was like in a bad way? We carried on speaking and I finally got to meet him. Joshua Stimson launched a brutal and frenzied attack on Molly McLaren, stabbing and slashing at her more than 50 times. She tried to move across to the passenger seat but could not escape. I had a call from one of my editors saying that something was going on at Chatham Dockside. So I jumped straight in my car, did the two minute drive. I'm here live at Chatham Dockside where the woman's reportedly been stabbed in the throat. Witnesses say they saw a man in a white vest who was covered in blood. It was very much an active crime scene. The forensics were there. You could see the car. There was blood up the windows. It was clear she was still inside. And it was at that point that we realised just how serious this was. This was a young woman murdered in broad daylight. Molly was probably the happiest person I've ever met. She always made me laugh. She was always up for a good time. <laughs> Molly is eating her burger and now she's laughing. There's nobody I don't think that's ever met her that never liked her. This is what you call friendship. <laughs> Look, do you know what? No one gives a pee back on a night out no, unless they're dedicated. Dedicated. And also... Dedicated. <gasps> also whipped. She was just the person that you relied on if you were having a bad day. She'd always cheer you up. Life and soul of the party. <laughs> you just did it. She did it. <laughs> she was on all of the platforms, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. She was like constantly uploading videos of her running or doing sport exercise, that kind of thing. Get to the same bit every day. I feel like I'm lagging. Everyone gets that bit. Just got to push through. It is not pretty. She wanted to go into personal training and she had a massive interest in nutrition, all that kind of stuff. She was an incredibly beautiful girl. Yeah, she probably could have met somebody in a pub or a club or something, but Tinder at the time, it was fairly new and everyone was sort of meeting people on there. Josh and Molly both matched on Tinder He was, I guess, her type, dark hair, quite keen interest in the gym. <laughs> I think they just, well, she fancied him initially and obviously the connection that they had. I think he was someone probably a bit different to who she'd dated before. Oh, you know that boy? I finally got to meet him. Literally seen him nearly every day for the past, well, over a week now. I do remember their honeymoon phase being, you know, really good fun. She was just really excited and I hadn't seen her like that before and she was genuinely in, you know, in a really happy place. She definitely thought she loved him, especially at the beginning part.
Molly stabbed and killed in broad daylight. The man accused of her murder appeared in court. Joshua Stimson, her former boyfriend from Walden near Rochester, was remanded in custody. He came in, he sat down, he seemed quite comfortable, easy to talk to. Yeah, he came across as a, a nice guy. He once said to Molly that he'd not had a girlfriend before she was his first girlfriend. She actually felt a little bit sorry for him, that maybe he was a bit lonely, whereas she wasn't. She was looking for love, but he seemed to be looking not just for love, but just being wanted by someone. Josh seemed to prefer to come here rather than Molly and him go to where he lived. We used to share a beer, talk about football, blah, blah, blah. And um, in the early days, we had no reason to believe that there was anything amiss with him. One psychiatrist's report suggested when Joshua Stimson killed her, he was suffering from a mental condition that resulted in him losing control. Therefore, he was guilty of manslaughter and not murder. Joshua Stimson was charged with murder. He admitted to the killing. And the, the issue, therefore, in the case was not did he kill, but what was his state of mind at the time of the killing? I got really annoyed the other day because I oversaw a message from a girl like asking him to go bowling and I got the right ass thinking that it was a date and then it turns out it was his friend and now he thinks I'm a psycho. I think the connection between Josh and Molly was the fact that they both had some sort of mental health problem. Molly suffered with anxiety and had bulimia. She wrote a couple of blogs on social media. which were really powerful and insanely brave to write. It helped her and it was massively helping other people. Even reading them was such an inspiration. Josh had said that he had bipolar. Molly had been quite open with her struggles with anxiety. So I feel like they were drawn on an emotional level and maybe that's why their relationship took off. claimed to be bipolar, it was a shock. But, you know, at that time, Molly had her issues. And we thought, OK, well, maybe it's a good match because she had issues, he's bipolar. We thought maybe they could help each other. I first saw Joshua Stimson at the request of the Crown Prosecution Service some months after the killing of Molly. The psychiatric defence that he was putting forward was that he was suffering from some form of psychiatric condition. He had spoken about suffering from bipolar affective disorder, and there was also a suggestion that he had an abnormal personality. And both of those conditions could reduce a charge of murder to one of manslaughter. Molly started to identify that Josh was maybe a bit controlling when she was quite busy with her dissertation and her exams and he would just turn up uninvited and he was quite persuasive that I'll just come and sit on the bed whilst you, you know, sit on your laptop and, you know, don't mind me, I'm, I'm just going to be around. And that was a little bit strange. He gave up his job and she was absolutely livid that he'd done that. He'd done it because he wanted to spend more time with her. She did feel really suffocated. She just wanted a bit of space, and I think that probably was one of the signs that something's not quite right. Molly said, oh, I'm not sure I feel the same about Josh as I did. 
She seemed to be getting cold feet and decided that it wasn't for her. You know, they met on an internet dating site. Do you actually know that what they've written on that profile is actually true? And in this case, it wasn't. Behind the smiling face, Joshua Stimpson was an obsessive and controlling boyfriend who ferociously stabbed Molly McLaren to death just 12 days after she broke off their seven-month relationship. Molly finished the relationship. He kept bombarding her with messages and she took him back. It was easier to take him back than not. He'd managed to convince her that actually he wasn't the problem, that her mental health was the issue, because she wasn't happy with herself and actually it wasn't anything to do with him. He actively encouraged her to go and see her GP and speak about her anxiety and I think that was really manipulative behaviour. It just didn't sit right at all. The first time I met Josh was at a family party. Molly, she was doing what Molly did and just was enjoying herself. He didn't join in. It was like he couldn't relax. The evening ended and he just walked on ahead of us, wouldn't walk with us. I was still awake and my phone went and it was Molly. And, can you come to our room? Josh is kicking off. I went in, Josh started saying, look at this, look at this, I've been filming her. Look at this, look at this. And Molly said, he's just taking films of me. He's trying to get something on me. He was having a go at her for having a good time and trying to record her reaction. It felt like he was trying to build leverage, something to hold against her. She was really worried about the conversations that they'd had in private, and she was worried that he would share them. They were arguing more. That's not what she wanted from a relationship. I think she was just worried that if there's a bit of a, an argument between them, what's he going to do? Joshua used his bipolar affective disorder to put pressure on Molly in order to get her to focus entirely on him. A significant warning sign, but of course Molly wanted to support him because she thought that he was going through a very difficult period. She didn't want him to be unhappy, but it just felt like he had to be her center of attention at all times. They'd already booked the holiday, so she said that she was going to go and see how she felt when she was there and also when she got back. She actually messaged me saying that she had an anxiety attack. All these things, you know, being worried about upsetting him, hurting his feelings, but also the fact that she kind of probably felt a bit stuck. All of that stuff and all that stress, it was just too much. I just remember when she got back and she said, you know, it's over. She obviously reached out to me and told me that they'd broken up and she felt quite relieved that she'd sort of done it which, you know, that's, that's a good outcome. Mm -hmm. 
he started again bombarding her with text messages, calls, take me back, take me back. Exactly a repetition of the first time, but she was so much stronger and she said, no, I'm not going to. When most relationships end, there can be intense feelings felt by either or both parties, and usually people work through them. There is a small minority where when a relationship ends, things become extremely toxic and potentially dangerous. In Joshua's case, he was undoubtedly upset, but that turned fairly quickly into anger and rage. Molly McLaren suffered injuries to her face, neck and hands. One brave onlooker tried to help, slamming the car door on Stimson's leg, but Joshua Stimson would not stop. Molly messaged me saying, you know, he's turned a bit nasty. She showed me the images of the kind of things he was posting. They were really personal. Like, oh, you know, you're lying to your family. Your mum doesn't even know the truth. Saying all this nasty, manipulative, evil stuff. He clearly wasn't doing it because he wanted to show how much he loved her. He was doing it, like, for the complete opposite reason. Josh became obsessed with what Molly was doing, who she was with and what she was up to. And as a way of keeping tabs on her, he roped in another woman who he'd previously matched with on Tinder to try and help him find out exactly what Molly was doing through social media. People who are enlisted into helping stalkers often don't understand the full extent of what's happening and the impact it's having on the victim. They're lied to and told a very different story, some fake narrative about what that person has done. Joshua's friend using the term, I love a good stock, in terms of having a look and following someone, being a bit nosy online, very different to actual stalking, which is extremely dangerous behavior, causes that fear of violence in the victim, in this case, Molly, causes alarm and distress. Social media allows a potential stalker to track an individual without having to physically get into close contact with them. And then enables the stalking behavior, which can culminate in violence. I was just flicking through Facebook and straight away saw something that had just been literally just put on by Josh. And the only reason that I'd seen it was because he'd tagged Joe in it. So I rang Molly straight away and she immediately, her reaction was, oh my God, Claire, what's he done? Molly said, mum, give me your phone. I gave her my phone and she deleted him. So I couldn't see what was on there. She said, he really wants to hurt me by getting at me through my family but there was nothing I didn't know about Molly. He was dragging up stuff. He was posting screenshots of texts between the two of them. So like private conversations they'd had. It was as if, you know, throughout their relationship, he was gathering ammo to, to set against her for this time. It got to the point where she was again getting so anxious. I said, no, this isn't right. I said, we've got to approach Facebook and have it taken down. So um, 
we both contacted Facebook. Um, unfortunately, you don't get to speak to any one person. It's all by messages. And we did this a couple of times. Eventually, they took the post down and said if he continued to do it, they would block him. Everything went quiet for a little while, and then he started doing it again. So we then got back in touch with Facebook. They looked into it, apparently, and they came back and said, we are not going to block him because there is nothing really that we can see that he's doing wrong. When Facebook took down that first post that Molly reported, they were looking at their code of conduct and saying, is this something we can't allow? Further posts met with their code of conduct, and that's because they were looking at those posts in isolation. They weren't looking at the bigger picture and the pattern of behaviour that Joshua was displaying, which was stalking. This was the moment police arrived at the Dockside Outlet Shopping Centre car park, just moments after Joshua Stimson stabbed his ex-girlfriend to death in her car. I came home and I said to Molly, right, we're going to take this one stage further. We'll go to the police. They took us both into a room. Molly told them all about it and they said, right, we need to speak to Josh. They made the phone call. He was very cool, very calm, very collected. In fact, came across quite cold, and uh, the police told him that he must stop what he's doing. If he didn't stop, they would have to come and arrest him. And he just kept saying, repeating, I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. And if you think I have, there's more to come. And those words still haunt me now. One psychiatrist's report suggested Joshua Stimson was guilty of manslaughter and not murder. But the prosecution produced a psychiatrist of their own. He pointed to the premeditated nature of the attack and said the stalker is always in control. Molly had applied for a job at a gym close to where we live, and one of our other friends worked there. And almost instantly, Josh had then started going to that gym. And he was going in the morning, he was going again in the afternoon, almost as if he was trying to look for her. But we'd never quite worked out how he knew that she would have been working there. She changed her name on Facebook and Instagram, and I guess she probably believed that on every platform she was kind of now safe. She set up another account on Instagram, and it was all about her fitness and supporting other people doing it, giving people advice, and it was all really positive, uplifting stuff. I think it was probably her way of just being like, let's just forget all of that stuff that's going on and let's just focus on stuff that I'm passionate about. Molly posted on Instagram, she was on this new journey and the same afternoon he was caught on CCTV in a nearby Asda where he bought a kitchen knife, the knife he used to murder her.
I got a message from Molly and it was a picture of Josh with a pigeon and he'd put the caption as one week single and already chatting up the birds. And she sent me a message saying that it completely made her evening. At the time, I'd celebrated with Molly because if he was posting, you know, oh, I'm single, it was a sign that he was going to move on. Looking back now, it feels like a trap. You think I'm gone, but actually, I'm not. We'd gone out for dinner to celebrate Molly and Rollin on a PT course. One of our other friends had been promoted and we had a lot to celebrate. So we went to the ship and trade in Dockside. That evening, Josh had arranged to meet another woman he'd met on a dating site. Molly posted on Instagram that she was going out that evening. Shortly afterwards, Josh texted his date with a change of plan. Molly had gone to the bar to order her food and come back and she looked like she'd seen a ghost. She said that she'd seen Josh. At first, Molly kind of went into shock. It was like a, oh my gosh, why is he here? I'd tried to comfort her and say, well, if he's going on a first date, he's probably picked somewhere you've never been. We'd had a bit of a laugh and a joke with some of our friends, but you could see that she was still really uneasy. So she made her excuses and she got home for Love Island. We'd later seen on her Instagram that she'd posted a picture of where she was but at that point, she didn't have Josh on social media. I saw her in the morning. She was up bright and early. She was going off to the gym, as she often did. And I think she felt she needed to go and work off what she'd been through. We had a little chat, told, told each other we loved each other, which whenever Molly, whenever I talked to Molly, we had a little saying, I would say, love you. Molly would say, love you more. And I would say, love you mostest. And that, that would then stop. But we had that saying. We said that, that was kind of one of the last things I said to her. On the 29th, it's apparent that Joshua Stimson was following Molly. Their car registrations were observed in the same area at the same time. Where he followed her from, one doesn't know, but one does know that he was following her. The court heard at 10.06, Molly arrives at Pure Gym at Chatham Dockside. At 10.14, Josh enters the car park. Joshua Simpson goes into the gym and he waits beside the door to the room in which she's in. He then goes in. Molly sent me a message with a picture of Josh saying that he'd turned up at the gym. My instant reaction was something's not right. He'd turned up at dinner the night before, now he'd turned up at the gym. And she went, Mum, he's just turned up. He's just turned up at the gym. 
And I said, you've got to be kidding. She said, how would he know I was here? I said, just ignore him and just come home. Just come straight home. They speak. And she asks him whether he's following her. My instant flicker was straight to social media. So I said to her, you know, do you have your location services on anything? How does he know you're there? She was also chatting to the guys in the group chat as well, and everyone was of the same opinion. She needed to just, just leave, you know, don't chat to him. He goes down the stairs from the gym and waits for a while, turns to go back into the gym, and then obviously changes his mind. Josh gets into his car and starts driving slowly around the car park. He's waiting for Molly to leave. I said to her to just go to the car and just go home. And that's what she was trying to do. CCTV shows Joshua Stimson's car driving very slowly. He's obviously watching where she's going where her car is. It's when she starts to get into the car that Joshua Stimson gets out and he attacks her. He yanked the door of her car open, jumped in and started stabbing her. He stabbed and killed in broad daylight. Emergency services were on the scene within minutes, but Molly could not be saved. It would normally take Molly about 15 minutes to get back, and sort of half an hour went by, and she wasn't home, so I texted her, and I heard nothing back, and I texted her again and just said, if you're stuck in traffic or something, pull over. Just let me know you're on your way. Nothing, nothing. And then I got a text from one of her good friends saying, have you seen there's something happening at Chatham Dockside? Well, I just immediately went cold. I just thought, that's Molly. Something's happened to Molly. I remember thinking, it can't possibly be Molly. There, there's absolutely got to be some kind of mistake. She messaged me. She told me she was going home. One of the guys that we worked with had pulled up Snapchat and seen Molly's location. It showed her as still being in Dockside. She'd never made it home. One witness tells me the lady desperately tried to alert people in the car park by screaming and beeping her horn. She suffered stab wounds and died at the scene. Officers arriving at the scene found Josh pacing up and down by Molly's car. He was covered in blood and he made no attempt to flee. Having killed her, Joshua Simpson stood by the car and waited for the police, and then he was arrested. He had achieved what he wanted to do. There was no need for him to run because there was nowhere for him to go. Well, I was um, on a drill ship 100 miles off the coast of Senegal. I got an email from Joe that said, call me straight away. And I thought, at the time, I thought, Christ, what's that? 
So I got my phone and went up to the bridge deck and I called Joan. She said, Josh has murdered Molly. I screamed so much and my body was shaking and he, she didn't even have to tell me who done it. I think one of the questions everyone asked was how Josh knew what Molly was doing that day. It's possible he could have guessed where she was going, but it's also possible, based on his recent stalking habits, that he could have tracked her through social media. Molly did use Snapchat quite a lot, posting little videos to people, or you can share them to your whole network. But at the time, there was a new function. It would show where you are. You would literally be able to see a map and zoom in and you could see the little character. Great functionality for sharing and being social, but really dangerous in the wrong hands. Tools like Snap Maps and social media sites are often used in harassment and cyberstalking cases. I don't understand how else he would have been able to find her without social media. The day that Molly was killed, her location services were switched on on Snapchat um, and using the Snap Map feature. Whether Josh used that to find out that she was leaving the house, I guess we'll never know. Joshua Stimson sobbed as he entered the dock here at Maidstone Crown Court today. He pleaded not guilty to the murder of Molly McLaren on the grounds of diminished responsibility. When I saw him, I was quite shocked because I'd seen so many pictures of this man. You know, he was attractive, he seemed quite slim. But when I actually saw him in the flesh, he was in a grey tracksuit. He looked a lot chunkier than the pictures. I remember thinking, it's not the same man, because he had put on loads of weight, his hair was a completely different colour, his beard was a completely different colour. He looked totally emotionless, and I needed to make eye contact with him, but he refused to make eye contact, and he just sat there looking like nothing, showed no remorse, showed no emotion whatsoever. Day by day, he was being shipped to the court by a security service. And they were wearing, like, medical uniforms. The prosecuting barrister, Philip Bennett, approached the judge and said, look, we're not having this because it it's sending a subliminal message to the jury that somehow he's got a medical problem. From then on, when he was delivered to the um, courtroom, they had their proper um, uniforms on. During the trial at Maidstone Crown Court, 26-year-old Joshua Stimson from Waldham had admitted manslaughter, claiming diminished responsibility, but denied murder. He claimed he was bipolar, and the court heard he had a personality disorder, something the defence argued meant he wasn't fully in control of his actions when he attacked Molly. The challenge in this case was to prove, at the time of the killing, that the defendant's state of mind was such that, in fact, he knew what he was doing and that his responsibility was not diminished. So I was asked to see Joshua Stimson at the request of the Crown Prosecution Service. The defence that he was putting forward was that he was suffering from some form of psychiatric condition at the time that he killed Molly. One of the aspects of the case, which was a theme throughout, was that Joshua Stimson um, uh, said that he had bipolar. I would just say any time they maybe had a disagreement 
that came up and you must spend time with me because I'm having a, you know, an episode. My diagnosis was that he was not suffering from bipolar affective disorder and did not reach the threshold for a personality disorder. In other words, he didn't have a medical defence to reduce to murder, to manslaughter. He'd told Molly that he'd had bipolar, and it, you know, that's not something that you think people lie about. Joshua Stimson's case, the separation of his parents and his feelings of abandonment by his mother would undoubtedly lay the groundwork for some of the development of that abnormal personality. There were some narcissistic aspects to his personality, so he was very conscious of his own appearance, but would not, by any means, afford him a defence to murder. We found out in the courtroom he never had bipolar, but I think he had a severe character defect. I think he needed to feel loved, he needed to feel supported, but to try and rest your case on him being bipolar was a complete mistake by the, um, the defence. During the trial, we found out he'd had several girlfriends. He'd been rejected by them and made threats and done similar kinds of things to them. Two ex-girlfriends gave evidence in court. One testified that after they'd split up, he'd posted abusive messages about her on social media. He also posted a threat under one of her holiday photos. It was chilling because it was then that we realised that he had done this before. One night, she was out at a party and received a message from him saying that there was something waiting for her at home. And when she got back, she found all of the tyres on her car had been slashed. She went to Staffordshire Police and Josh was given a warning. A police officer sent him a text and a voicemail telling him to stop. They had gone to the police, but because there was no physical evidence to say that it was him, uh, it hadn't been logged. So there was no history there on him at all. One of the more surprising aspects of the trial was the testimony of a woman who Josh had reached out to to try and help him find out exactly what Molly was doing through social media. The girl had been contacted by Josh on a dating app in 2016, and though they never met, she considered him to be one of her best mates. The judge asked, did she understand what she was doing? Her answers appeared to demonstrate that she really wasn't aware of the impact of what she was doing upon what happened to Molly. Today, Molly's devastated family were in court as a jury took less than four hours to find Stimson guilty of murder, and a judge sentenced him to life in prison with a minimum term of 26 years. The verdict has brought us a small measure of comfort, but it seems that nothing will take away the pain or allow us to come to terms with our Molly being taken from us. We are serving a lifetime of pain, anguish and loss. Molly Culbridge was how much I miss her. I miss our relationship, but I miss what she was going to be, what she was going to do with her life. I can't imagine what she went through in that car. 
I just wish I could have done more as a father. I just wish I'd never told her to come home. I wish I'd told her to go and be with other people, not to be on her own, to be with others. I don't hold myself responsible, don't get me wrong. But I just... There's no one responsible but him. She... She was the light of her lives. <laughs>